Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Khalil Jahshan. I'm executive director of Arab Center Washington, D.C., and I would like to welcome all of you uh, to uh, this special panel uh, dealing with the uh, the main event uh, this week in, in Washington, D.C., which is the uh, U.S.-Qatar uh, strategic uh, dialogue. The title of our panel today is U.S.-Qatar relations, uncertainty, or strategic uh, partnership. And um, when we think uh, over the past uh, seven months almost, uh, the crisis that emerged uh, in the Gulf has seen the bilateral relationship uh, between Washington and Doha go, go through some uh, different phases. And definitely, I think, the event we have witnessed uh, on Tuesday of this week uh, here in Washington has, has been a um, significant, uh, in my judgment, turning point uh, in the bilateral relationship, uh, not just uh, between the U.S. and Qatar, but I feel in terms of U.S. policy uh, in the Gulf and toward the GCC uh, in general because it has, I think, changed uh, the parameters uh, of, of the conflict that we have uh, witnessed uh, over the past uh, uh, few months. So going back to uh, seven months ago when the relationship was going through some turbulence as a result of a tweet here and a tweet there, uh, it seems that the uh, relationship has emerged into a strategic uh, partnership uh, between uh, the two uh, uh, the two countries, and we would like to kind of discuss basically three components of that, uh, the political context uh, of this relationship, uh, the legal uh, context uh, of that, and in a way, the bilateral political uh, diplomatic uh, context, what's in it uh, from the uh, U.S. Uh, perspective. Uh, to do that, we have uh, three uh, great uh, friends of the center with us uh, here today. I'm very honored. Uh, to host them and, and to present them to you uh, today. Uh, they're well known in terms of U.S.-Qatari uh, relationship and U.S.-Arab relations uh, uh, in, in general. Uh, uh, the um, first uh, person seated to uh, my left who will be speaking first, uh, Dr. Majid Al-Ansari, who is a professor of political sociology and researcher at uh, Qatar uh, University. He has written and lectured extensively uh, in, the, in the region and internationally, uh, particularly since the beginning of this crisis. He has been a uh, kind of a familiar voice and, and face in trying to make sense uh, out of this uh, crisis and explain it uh, to the international community. Uh, next uh, is uh, Dr. Remel Ansari, who um, is Associate Dean of Graduate and, uh, Studies and Professor of Law uh, at Qatar uh, University. Uh, she has also, she studied in the United States, she taught here, and, and uh, she's well versed in the legal aspect, particularly with regards to some of the issues uh, that were part and parcel, uh, if you will, of the strategic dialogue uh, that took place uh, uh, this week, uh, Tuesday, uh, here uh, in, uh, in Washington. And uh, last but not least, our good friend uh, William Lawrence, who is a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University. Uh, some of you are familiar with his great work on North Africa, his expertise uh, back when he was with State and, and post that, uh, well-known expert uh, on North Africa. But uh, today he will be uh, helping, helping us uh, try to kind of put things in perspective uh, with regard to the U.S. Uh, component uh, in the, of this bilateral relationship and the development uh, that we have seen this week. Uh, more complete bios are available to you uh, in the uh, flyer that was distributed uh, at the door, and, and uh, two more uh, documents were also available for you at the door. One was the four major speeches uh, delivered on uh, uh, Tuesday, at the dialogue by our Secretary uh, of State uh, Tillerson and Secretary of Defense Mattis and their uh, colleagues or counterparts, Qatari counterparts, uh, at, uh, at, the at the dialogue. Uh, the Foreign Minister, uh, Mohammed bin Abdurrahman uh, Al Thani, and also the uh, Defense uh, Minister uh, Al Atiyah, Khalid, Dr. Khalid Al Atiyah, uh, who represented uh, Qatar uh, at the dialogue. 
But uh, the two countries basically uh, manage on, on Tuesday uh, to kind of, uh, I think, lead uh, the bilateral relationship between the two countries uh, to a new uh, plateau, a new level of strategic uh, significance, having focused on uh, a whole array, actually, of array of, of uh, uh, issues uh, that constitute the bilateral relationship between the two, uh, you know, underscoring, uh, if you will, the strength uh, of that relationship, uh, dealing with uh, the political, dealing with uh, the economic, dealing with the investments, uh, dealing with the security uh, relationship uh, between the two uh, countries. So I, I personally believe, at least for those of us who are uh, continuously studying the region, uh, this development uh, this week uh, on, on Tuesday uh, is certainly uh, a significant uh, food for thought uh, for those of us who will continue uh, to look at how the United States, particularly this administration, is trying to cope with its relationship with its allies in the region at a very difficult time when sometimes uh, these allies are not necessarily uh, in harmony uh, with regards to their uh, regional or international uh, objectives. So we'll go ahead at, at this point and uh, start with uh, uh, basically Dr. Majid uh, giving us uh, the first presentation and then we'll proceed in the order uh, that I indicated. Each speaker will have about 12 uh, minutes and uh, then we will spend the balance of our time once all three speakers make their presentations uh, in the art of conversation, uh, welcoming your uh, questions. And I'd like to just remind you that uh, the cards on your seats uh, and pencils are for those who might have a comment, uh, preferably a question, uh, to our guests. Uh, if you do that, uh, when the uh, inspiration hits during the presentation, and uh, we will be gathering uh, those questions uh, at the end uh, of the uh, presentations, and I'll be more than glad to present your question uh, either specifically to a particular speaker or to the whole uh, panel. Uh, Dr. Majid, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Khalid, and thanks to uh, all of you for attending in this morning, which is not as cold as yesterday's morning, but certainly is still, at least to our uh, feeling quite uh, colder than we expected. The, uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Qatar is not a new relationship. It spans for about half a decade now. The, uh, this relationship was always part of the GCC Security Pact, which actually kind of framed the relationship between that piece of the world and the United States of America. During the Cold War, the GCC states were uh, quite anxious to be part of the Western camp for one main reason, which is that the, the Eastern camp was looked as, uh, at as the main threat to the political system and the ideology that governed this part of the world. These were monarchies. Uh, these monarchies were traditional. The societies were conservative, Muslim conservative, and there was a push from uh, what was called at the time the progressive regimes to uh, destabilize the region, to end these monarchies and to replace them with uh, leftist republics. And therefore, this meant that there was always a strong leaning towards the West when it came to the GCC. And I start with this historically just to explain that there was always a relationship between the United States and this region one way or the other. But this uh, relationship certainly was strengthened by the war in Kuwait, when uh, the United States established a military presence in most of the Gulf uh, states one way or the other. At the time, there was uh, a great military uh, presence in the, United, in the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the naval uh, power in Bahrain, the uh, forces in Kuwait, then in Qatar through uh, al Udaid, some uh, minimal presence in Oman. So all of the GCC was actually uh, had presence militarily from the United States, and this kind of sprung this relationship into three pillars. The first pillar of that relationship was this military presence, the security pact that meant that the United States would always be uh, there if there was any uh, attempt to destabilize the region, either would it be from Iran, the main reason behind actually uh, initiating the Gulf Cooperation Council was the threat of, uh, of Iran, or whether it be, you know, during the Cold War from uh, 
the eastern camps incursion into the region, or if it was simply protecting Arab states from each other, which was always, of course, you know, the concern within these monarchies that were looked at as new states, new countries within the sea of turbulence in the region. The GCC was famed for being an oasis of stability since the end of the Second Gulf War, and this meant that uh, there was always a stance that this part of the world can be a strategic base for the United States of America, militarily, economically, and politically. Uh, stable economies to a large extent. Uh, the uh, political situation was uh, not unnerving to any external powers. And this meant that, as we said, the first pillar, the military pillar of the relationship between the GCC and the United States would actually expand in the coming years. Of course, then we go to the second part, which is the economic uh, pillar of this relationship. A strong economies, and not only strong economies, an abundance of, uh, of cash in that region. And that abundance of cash, you know, the abundance of uh, or the strength of the energy sector meant that the United States could actually establish, establish uh, economic hubs in the region and could make use of these uh, <coughs> economic strong points to advance its regional uh, interests and regional uh, projects. And that we have seen that, of course, through many uh, uh, expand, uh, expanding relationships on the, in the banking sector and investment. These countries have invested highly in the United uh, States, just yesterday, our, or the day before, sorry, our uh, Minister of uh, Defense talked very uh, highly of the 10, 10 billion investment in uh, U.S. infrastructure, and so on. The final pillar of the relationship between the, uh, the United States and these uh, G GCC states is the political and strategic side of it. Politically and strategically, of course, the influence of the United States in the region was the catalyst for that influence was the, G the GCC region because the military presence in that area, the strong relationship between the governments of uh, these countries and the United States allowed the United States to have a stronger presence in the rest of the Arab world, whereas uh, other countries actually had better relationships during the Cold War with Russia. Because of that strong presence in the GCC, we have seen uh, the U.S. influence expand to North Africa and to the, uh, the other Arab states very strongly. Now, this is when we talk about the GCC in general. Now, the question now would be, what about Qatar itself? In the GCC, there is this dynamic that any discussion of the political situation there has to acknowledge. The dynamic is that we have one big Hegemon, which is Saudi Arabia, and then we have the coastal states. The coastal states here being Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, the UAE, and Oman. During our, well, I, I mean, short history in the, in the region of actually having established political entities, we have seen this dynamic always play out. The hegemon, Saudi Arabia, always tries to gain political prominence, either through actually invading or uh, annexing pieces of land from these coastal states or through political influence over these states. You will not, of course, be surprised to know that there is uh, a border dispute between Saudi Arabia and all, except for Bahrain, all of the coastal states. And basically, politically speaking, Bahrain is kind of annexed to Saudi Arabia. There is no uh, independent political uh, or at least foreign policy uh, of uh, Bahrain when compared, of course, or when uh, it's uh, concerned with Saudi Arabia. There's a dispute even between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, which has not been resolved. It is still an issue. There is a piece of land there, an extremely large piece of land uh, of, uh, of the UAE that's been uh, annexed to Saudi Arabia. And uh, there is still talk about what would happen to that in the future. Uh, Qatar has the same problem, of course. There's a disputed uh, area that none of the two states now exist in. Saudi Arabia refuses to hand over officially to the Qataris, although there has been, of course, uh, an official uh, acceptance that this piece of land is actually part of Qatar's uh, region. But there is also that dispute. So it has been always the case that Saudi Arabia will try to in, in enact political influence on these countries. For Qatar especially, being always, and I always like to use this analogy, being the younger sister uh, in a household of uh, older sisters, 
uh, Qatar has always been different. It's been different when it comes to uh, independence of its foreign policy. It's been different to, uh, when it comes to its relationship with the world and with the region, with its influence and what it supports in the region. Qatar has always been a supporter, uh, historically actually, of uh, populist movements in the region. Now, uh, we all acknowledge, of course, that Qatar at the moment is not a democracy, but it has supported a, de a democratic push in the region, not only uh, well, since 2006, not only during the Arab Spring. And uh, there was always a problematic relationship between the more traditional, the older sisters, the conservative sisters, and this younger, very uh, outgoing uh, sister that would go into the world very uh, bol boldly and sometimes uh, is in conflict with the neighbors and with the, the powers that be, even the United States, because of that foreign uh, policy. This also affected the relationship between Qatar and the United States of America. In 92, uh, between 92 and 95, the relationship was strengthened, especially when the previous emir, who we know, now call the emir father, Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa, came into power. When he came into power, he came through a bloodless uh, coup. He, uh, he was installed after his uh, father, who later, of course, returned to the country and lived out his days in, uh, in Doha. Uh, and that was not to the liking of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Not because uh, that they didn't like the new emir, or they, they liked the previous one. It was because there was always that dynamic of the hegemon. And uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE always wanted to enact influence. The previous emir, the grandfather emir, who has passed away recently, uh, had always uh, enacted on a policy of not antagonizing Saudi Arabia. While the father Amir, Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa, uh, has always maintained that Qatar should have its separate, independent foreign policy and that the security of Qatar remains within that independence. If, there, if uh, Qatar did not have that independent, independent foreign policy, it meant that it would always be part of the Saudi Arabia's uh, influence in the region. It would not be able to protect itself against any political push from Saudi Arabia. And this meant that there was, a, a, after, one year later in 96, an attempted coup that was orchestrated by the Saudis and the uh, Emiratis. Here, the United States, of course, supported the Qatari government. And we've seen, of course, that uh, we moved towards a more strong relationship, especially after the incidents in Dahran, where the uh, American troops were attacked by a terrorist uh, attack. And the uh, Americans decided to move their base of influence militarily to to al Adade base in Doha, which was, of course, that was still in talks. Our previous prime minister actually said that he got a call one morning from the border uh, saying that there are American troops on the border and they're asking to come in. And that was about one day after the uh, incident in uh, Dahran. The establishment of al Adade, of course, meant that now Qatar was uh, joined by the hip with uh, the United States of America. There was a large military uh, presence of 11,000 soldiers and, of course, Cent, uh, central Command and uh, very high prominent uh, figures. Even Mattis himself was the head of that base uh, for a while and uh, others who are quite uh, prominent now in the administration. And this is what meant that now, and I would like to end with this, now this dialogue is actually a result of that relationship after this relationship was uh, lost part of its significance uh, after so many disagreements between Qatar and the United States about the region, and especially after Trump came into power and decided that he would support the saudi Marathi alliance against Qatar in the beginning of this crisis. Now we can see, of course, that there's a difference uh, in the tone. The uh, secretaries of state and defense are uh, talking very confidently these days in support of, of Qatar. We've seen that, of course, during the dialogue and before it. What we expect now, and maybe we can talk about this in discussion uh, more, what we expect, accept now, expect now is that this dialogue was the catalyst for a new position from the administration here to support Qatar against the blockade and to say to Saudi Arabia and the United States that, listen, there, are absolutely, there is absolutely no way for this to go on. It has to stop one way or the other. You guys have to work out your differences together on, uh, the, on the table and not through this uh, continued escalation uh, in the media and the military escalation that took place during the past uh, couple of months. I will end with this, and hopefully during the discussion we can talk more about how the dialogue affected, and I thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Majid, for uh, this uh, survey, uh, both in terms of uh, political and historic facts.
uh, that puts the uh, dialogue that we have witnessed this week uh, in Washington in context. Now we will move to some of the legal uh, issues or components of the partnership uh, between the two. Uh, particularly, there are some issues that were brought to our attention through the media uh, that people maybe never noticed before, assuming that uh, the dialogue just for the first time uh, brought him up, although some of these issues uh, are part of that history uh, that uh, Dr. Majid just uh, referred to. Uh, Dr. Reen, please go ahead. Having policy covered already, uh, in our sphere, the legal sphere, it's all about certainty and uncertainty. And we lawyers perceive uh, politics as uncertainty. Why? Because law are drafted tangible, so it's text, you can touch it, and it's guarantee you the way forward. So what I'm truly sure of and certain of, two things, which is directly tied to the talk of today. I'm sure that we want to see nations step forward better society, better life. The second thing that I'm sure of is that we want to stop mantras from growing worrisome if not rehearsed. And we lawyers believe that law can do this. Law provides us the solid foundation that we can fly from. It provides us guarantees for any contracts, cooperation, collaboration, and partnership. Talking about partnership, what is the, to the topic of our today's talk, um, strategic partnership between Qatar and the USA. Is it doable? Would it be successful or not? A simple, act, a simple answer to this would be, why not? Injecting more real reality to this answer, the why not, given the fact that we're coming from a civil law country, and here it's a common law country, so different systems, but when you dig into the legal terminology, you will find that law is broad. So you can apply this using two terminologies. The first one, keeping in mind that you have to be picky. Why? Because law offers you a variety of uh, instruments, be it MOU, initiative, agreements, uh, contracts. And it could, it could start with the, the title of partnership, but partnership bears a lot of legal instruments. The second thing is sign, signifies the beauty of the law. That is so flexible, although it's dry, but it's so flexible being that it has the ability to work backwards. What I mean back, by backwards, if we have two partners or two parties, they set a clear purpose and they want it to be applied in real life. Once that is set and clear, they can work backwards from this purpose, picking the best fit to, uh, to attain this, uh, this goal. In, our, in, our, uh, in the nowadays and the current situation, it would be MOUs because it has a, a minimum legal obligation, but it is a guarantee for the future relationship. Let us pose the same question again. Would that be doable, the relationship between two countries? Another simple answer to this question would be, it is not Qatar's first rodeo. It, it dates back way long in the history, in 1973. Dr. Madi already covered the political side of it. I'm covering the legal side, uh, the legal aspect of it. It started in the Security Initiative, 1973, and shortly after, 1991, we have the military agreement, al adid base, Saliya Army Base, and the, uh, the headquarter of the U.S. commander. So that was the military aspect to it. It was done through MOUs and agreements. Shortly after, they broadened their scope and, and, and perspective reaching to education. In 1998, we have solid contracts with the educational institute, prominent educational institutes in the US, uh, namely Georgetown, uh, Northwestern, Cornell, Carnegie Mellon, and other universities. As a result of that, we have, we have the education city, um, hosting the most prestigious universities in the US, side to side to other French, Canadian, and British universities. So now we covered security, milita security, military, and education. Paying close attention to the current situation and the recent MOUs that have, that have been signed between USA and Qatar, they even broadened the scope to energy and civil aviation. I'm not saying that I'm now not aware of all fields of law, but I'm but I really want to take the example of the area that I'm really specialized in, which is AML CTF which was the highlight and the major focus of since two, uh, two, summer 2017, the MOU that has been signed between Qatar and uh, USA, dealing with terrorism, strengthening the, uh, the collaborative effort between Qatar and USA, trying in, in an attempt to try to end this problem. So basically, USA is trying to outline, or outline a framework or telling Qatar what to do next, or how to strengthen, strengthen its effort in the quest of fighting terrorism.
to, to create more assurance and to give you a sense of the readiness of the state of Qatar for this strategic relationship, let me tell you the, the narrative of the Qatar, Qatar story with AML CTF. It has an international aspect which, which is applied to almost each and every law in the country. So it all started in 2007. Uh, we had an assessment from the FARF, the Financial Action Task Force, in 2007, assessing the current existing law de dealing with AML CTF counterterrorism financing and, and, and money laundry. So based on this assessment, Qatar directly saw the, the technical assist, uh, assistant of IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And shortly after, in 2010, we had what is called law number four of 2010, which is the AML CTF law. It is the law in the country dealing with everything that has to do with the CTF and AML. I'm not saying that it's the only legal instrument. This legal instrument was the trigger to other rules, regulations, and mandates internal policies in the country and outside the country. So going back to the, uh, the international organization, which is the FATF, what is the FATF? It is a uh, financial tax action task force. It issues uh, international standards dealing with terrorism financing and, 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 and money laundry. They call them the 40 plus recommendation. The 40 recommendation are dealing specifically with money laundry. They had special nine recommendation after the nine one, the tragedy the tragic 911 incidents that happened in the US. Then the eighth recommendation uh, de dealt with terrorism financing, and the ninth dealt with mass destruction weapon and proliferation. So that was the, the task of the IMF. It wanted to make sure that each and every member state to this organization is compliant to the standards, making sure that there's, there, there's no potential for misuse for the financial system. So as a result of this collaboration between the country and this international organization, we have the law number four of 2010. The 83 article 10 chapters law uh, that dealt with the regular uh, titles that you will find it in almost each and every civil legal system code, definitions, legal terminologies, uh, I would say regulation for the NAMLEC, which is the National Anti-Money Laundry Committee, the FIUs, the Financial Intelligence Unit, and, or the Financial Information Unit. Of course, sanctions, and they were real sanctions, uh, finance and imprisonment, so it, it goes up to five million sometimes and 10 years imprisonment. And it had a, a special aspect to it, which is the international cooperation. This signals out a message that Qatar never intended to be isolated, nor it, would, it wanted to be a big war, chest of, for the war, it wanted to be part of the community. Now that was the story of Qatar and the international organization. This uh, USA happens to be part of this international organization. So looking at it from the holistic approach, you will see that both countries dealt with each other directly and indirectly. Directly through the history from 1973, and directly through inter the international scheme. Let us ask ourselves the same question again. Is that doable? Through the law, I assure you it's do doable because law is flexible, but you, ha you have to be careful and wise while, while picking the right legal instrument. Uh, we have proved the, through the history that we have best practices using legal terminology, American legal terminology. In the legal system, the civil legal system, we don't have precedents. But in the American legal system, we, we use precedents. So we have precedents president in this case, the case of the strategic relationship between Qatar and USA proving from, uh, proves the likelihood of success of this relationship since 1973 until now, until recently now, 2007, the MOU, and the recent MOUs during this week, tackling energy sector, civil aviation. So I just want to end up and wrap up the talk with a small quote, uh, a statement by the State Secretary, uh, Rick Tillerson, where he assured the fact that, or the likelihood of success of this relationship, and it's, it didn't, it, it's not, uh, it's not a current uh, relationship. It has history. It has breadth and depth since day one. He said that Qatar is a strong partner and long-term friend. That was a general statement, but the specific statement dealing with terrorism, yesterday I mentioned it in one of the talks that, is, that has to do with illicit fun funding, uh, dealing, uh, tackling from the Middle Eastern perspective. So Secretary, St Secretary of State said Qatar has been clear and reasonable since day one. 
So Qatar has been trying to do its best in the quest of fighting terrorism, strengthening international cooperation in all aspects, be it ter uh, countering terrorism, education, energy, civil aviation, since day one. But now, in light of the current situation, those efforts got polished out, I would say polished out. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reem, for uh, very clear, uh, uh, or made some of these complicated uh, legal issues quite clear to some of us who are not well versed in uh, the legal aspect of uh, bilateral uh, relations, including uh, this particular uh, uh, memorandum of understanding and the strategic dialogue that uh, we witnessed. I would like to just, before we proceed to the next speaker, uh, it just occurred to me that when you talk about uh, the increasing uh, uh, level or volume of investments uh, by the Qataris uh, uh, in, in American economy, which has definitely surpassed uh, at least 50 billion uh, for the next phase, some people say closer, inching closer to 100 billion, uh, experts tell me that uh, for every billion, uh, in investment, you are creating between 14,000 to 20,000 manpower jobs uh, in this country. So uh, in the most conservative estimate that I have, this involves at least 750,000 manpower jobs over the duration uh, of this investment. So at a time when, when the U.S. administration is counting one job at a time and taking credit for it, I think this is a very significant uh, number and a very significant partnership uh, to uh, think about. Uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. William uh, Lawrence now will uh, cover the U.S. Qatari strategic relationship uh, from a U.S. perspective. Uh, William? Thank you, Khalil, and uh, thank you for organizing this and to the Arab Center for um, spotlighting this very important issue, and thank you to Majid and Reem for uh, uh, very excellent remarks. Um, this crisis isn't looked at enough. One of my colleagues at George Washington wrote a famous op-ed where he basically said the crisis in the Gulf wasn't a crisis. And if you look at the media coverage, it's quite amazing that uh, in Qatar it gets a lot of coverage. In some of the Gulf countries that are a little bit closer to Qatar it gets a little. And there's almost a media blackout now on coverage of the Gulf crisis in the blockading countries and very little mention in the United States as well. Interestingly, there was also that big anti-Qatar campaign uh, in the U.S. media, and that's gone silent. So all of this is sort of very interesting as we uh, uh, look at the evolving U.S.-Qatari relationship uh, in the context of um, who, who's discussing what and who's not discussing anything anymore. Um, the U.S.-Qatari relationship in some ways, and perhaps in most ways, has never been stronger. If you look simply at the frequency of visits by U.S. officials, I mean, how many countries in the world have had the Secretary of State three visits, Secretary of Defense two visits, uh, Secretary of Energy, uh, none. I mean, there's almost no country that's getting the level of, uh, of senior attention. There was a phone call from President Trump and, uh, and, and the Emir uh, on the 15th of this month. Uh, uh, so so the, 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 the level of engagement of the U.S. government is, is astoundingly high. Um, as uh, Khalid said, I, I've spent a lot of my professional career focused on North Africa, but my original training was in Middle East, including the Gulf, and I've uh, recently picked up a training uh, in the U.S. government on Middle East and Gulf security issues. Um, and as I, as I, I dial back in on, on these relationships, uh, uh, the changes, not only have there been massive changes in the Gulf, which have been well studied, but the changes um, in, in the U.S. relation to these countries have, have gone through a, a equally astounding transformations uh, uh, over time, and it's, 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 it's very interesting to see uh, those transformations. Now, um, this, uh, th the main questions we have today are, are uh, you know, what are the major objectives and outcomes of the upcoming strategic meetings? So those have been well outlined in these, in these press releases, and I think the baskets, as Reem and Mejid uh, covered them have, uh, have been correct. This uh, sort of political basket and a defense basket and a, um, a defense including counterterrorism and, and a variety of security issues, including regional security issues. Um, and then there's uh, trade and investment. There's the aviation uh, issue, um, which has been a very high priority for the U.S. government. I'll get back to that a little bit later. 
Um, and then, of course, there are these uh, softer um, engagements. And, and let me flag also, there's a food security issue now in, in Qatar uh, and increasing uh, intention from the um, international community on uh, the humanitarian consequences of the crisis as we move from what some call a, a short-term crisis. We are now into a medium-term crisis and we're starting to talk about what is a long-term crisis? What is a non-resolution of the Qatar crisis look uh, for, for the geopolitical interests, but also just for the welfare of the Qatari people and the, and the region. Um, now, a US, uh, or, or the US government's position on Qatar uh, is not just one thing, and certainly not a set of confusing tweets <laughs> from earlier in the year, as, as Khalil mentioned. Um, it's, it's a set of US institutions and a range of ways that they look at the Qatar crisis. Uh, and then the White House itself and its own factions. I think one useful way, which is a partially good explanation to look at it, is um, the triangle between uh, the defense and intelligence community, state and the, let's say, engagement and development uh, and democracy parts of the US government, and then the, uh, uh, the White House and the, and, the, and the political side of things which has its position on Qatar. At the beginning of the crisis, it was very clear if you analyzed the various positions within the US government that the defense and intelligence people wanted a quick res resolution, almost to the point of not caring you know, which side made con uh, uh, concessions and which side didn't. Um, the State Department took a bit of a middle position, aware of all the whole range of issues, uh, um, uh, including those connected to the, the 13 demands and the, the 13 and 14 secret agreements that, 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 that came up. Uh, and within the White House, the position was uh, uh, quite anti-Qatar at the beginning. Um, and, 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 and a lot of this was swept up in the anti-Iran sentiment with the, the new administration. Um, what's been happening over time is that the State Department has been, and, and, it's, and the sort of basket of agencies around state have been moving in the direction of the Defense Department position. And now we're at a point where there's almost unanimity in that, in that position. Uh, and that's interesting because it's isolated some of those other voices um, uh, within the, uh, the conservative foreign policy establishment in Washington and, and within the White House that, that saw pressure on Qatar as part of achieving a set of overall uh, security objectives for the MENA region. Now, at the Arab Center event uh, in October, we had one of the best statements of U.S. foreign policy interests for the MENA region uh, that I've seen anywhere, like Joan Palachik's uh, mm -hmm. lunch uh, discussion. And I counted 17 uh, 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 objectives in the Trump administration for the Middle East. Um, uh, uh, number one is, is defeating ISIS, and that has to be part of the conversation. Uh, uh, with Qatar, and, and, and that's part of a growing part of the conversation. Number two is confronting Iran. Number three was stabilizing Iraq. Number four was dealing with the various aspects of the horrible Syrian and Yemen situations, including the humanitarian catastrophe, the huge refugee populations, the cholera outbreak. This has been part, increasingly part of the U.S.-Qatar uh, conversation as well. Um, and then uh, John Palachik did name the GCC crisis. Uh, the U.S. position being that the Gulf crisis is a distraction from the real issues in Yemen and Syria, she said. Uh, the administration sees the GCC as a single entity and regrets to see these fractures. A dysfunctional GCC is not in the Gulf for U.S. interests. General Zinni had also made a statement that the GCC is essential to U.S. operations in the region, which gets to another point I wanted to make, which is that the infrastructure of the U.S. Uh, defense and military and, and, and intelligence operations in Qatar are large and growing. Um, and there are, there are certain things about how SIGINT is handled there, how operations towards Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan are handled there, that even the runways for B-52s, there are, there are many aspects of that infrastructure which would be much harder for the U.S. to move. Uh, and it's very interesting that part of the discussion this week in the strategic dialogue has been uh, making the base uh, permanent, uh, 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 with a, I guess there's talk of a 2040 uh, uh, goal. Whereas, meanwhile, the Emiratis have been offering to move all these operations to the Emirates, and there's been other discussions as well. 
Um, but I see no appetite, getting back to my triangle, if you remember, in the defense and intelligence community to move anything out of Qatar, quite the opposite. They'd like to, they to keep things there and keep them growing. Now, in his uh, State of the Union address uh, earlier this week, Trump um, did not mention uh, the Gulf crisis nor most of the Middle East issues that Joan did in her October speech. Um, he did mention uh, uh, Iran by name, Iraq by name, uh, Syria by name, and uh, Israel by name. Uh, uh, most of that in the context of the fight against terrorism and, and the moving of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Um, he also said something interesting that hasn't gotten that much attention. That he said, I'm asking Congress to pass legislation to help ensure American foreign assistance dollars always serve American interests and only go to American friends. Um, I'm also noticing within the administration an attempt to apply a similar standard to all engagements. And there's, uh, there's a new binary that seems to be growing between friends, not friends, or friends right now, <laughs> hopefully, you know, uh, uh, friends of the moment, they get more attention. Um, uh, and this is part of what I would call the transactional approach of this administration. Um, a tra transactional in the traditional psychological sense of the term, or, or business sense of the term, but, all, but or actually, let's say psychological, and then the second one, transactional in a business sense. Um, transactionally, the U.S. is looking um, to uh, make deals in solving this list of issues. And the degree to which uh, Qatar, uh, in addition to all the investments it's making and the arms purchase and all these things, can address specifically uh, each of these high priority issues for the U.S., which they are doing in a strategic dialogue, that transaction uh, helps the development of this relationship. The other transaction is the simple bottom dollar uh, uh, economic transactions, and Halila suggested, you know, what, what those numbers look like. Uh, meanwhile, Qatar is investing in Texas and Harvey victims. I mean, the, the, the range of investments in the U.S. have been quite interesting, too, as, as uh, uh, um, uh, both sides look for ways, and the State Department is actively involved in this as the Defense Department, to bolster the Qatari um, uh, 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 U.S. relationship uh, 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 for, for a set of strategic goals. I also find it um, uh, 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 very interesting that um, all of the U.S. statements um, uh, publicly uh, have um, uh, been neutral, um, but the gestures haven't been. And there's an increasing, in my discussions for this, uh, for this uh, uh, event today, um, it, was, it was quite clear to me that uh, people who follow this relationship closely feel that Doha has taken a hit, Riyadh has taken a hit, Dubai has taken a hit, and Abu Dhabi hasn't. Um, and, and, and there's a, a very interesting sort of an analysis of, uh, and of course this administration looks at branding, you know, who's, whose brand <laughs> is doing better and whose brand isn't. Um, and and uh, 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 it's, it's very clear that um, uh, 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 all of the U.S. interests in the Middle East uh, are hurt if the branding of all of these capitals goes down as well. Um, I'm going to, I've been given the signal, so I'm going to just uh, wrap up here. Um, uh, so my overall prediction is the U.S. will continue to invest. It's the largest investor in Qatar's energy sector. Um, it's going to try to continue to make these arms deals. It's going to look for help. Um, uh, 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 in, in all of these transactional ways that I talked about. Um, uh, there are issues um, uh, with the uh, growing Qatari-Russian relationship and new sanctions coming towards Russia, potentially, which will uh, need to be discussed. Um, uh, 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 but to conclude, I'd like to quote Michael Porter, the fam famous uh, uh, strategic uh, partnership uh, uh, analyst uh, up at Harvard, who says, Strategy is about deciding what not to do. And increasingly, um, what I'm looking here is the U.S. is increasingly not doing and not saying things that it was saying before that was making this crisis worse. Qatar is increasingly not doing and not saying things um, uh, uh, which puts it in a better position. Um, so even if we don't get um, a short-term solution uh, to the Gulf crisis, um, the non-dialogue coming out of Riyadh and out of uh, Abu Dhabi on this in itself is sort of a, a, a win for Qatar and serves everyone's interests. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Um, 
before we proceed uh, to the next uh, phase of our program, let me just take advantage of this little break by uh, announcing an event uh, next door for those of you who might be interested at 12.30. Uh, our colleagues uh, at the Gulf uh, International Forum uh, are holding their first uh, kind of annual uh, uh, event entitled Future of the GCC, the Continuing Gulf Crisis. And that will be over luncheon uh, from starting at 12.30 to 2.30, if you are interested and can hang around. Uh, for that, uh, they have been gracious to extend uh, an invitation for those of you who uh, would like uh, to do that. So if you could do that, uh, please join us in, in uh, joining them. And uh, the speakers are very impressive. Uh, there will be Dr. Obeid Al-Wasmi from the George Washington University, a former member of uh, Kuwait's uh, parliament. Also, uh, Dr. Jean-Francois Seznek from uh, the John Hopkins. Uh, the Professor David uh, DeRoche uh, and uh, also Kenneth Katzman uh, from the uh, Congressional Research uh, Service uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, and now it's uh, your time uh, to uh, raise or ask questions. Feel free to do so uh, from individual uh, speakers or if you'd like to address your question in general. Uh, to the panel, feel free to do so. Please use the cards uh, on your seat or in front of you and uh, write legibly. Uh, I cannot decipher codes. Uh, <laughs> if you want me to read uh, your question, I will be uh, more than glad to direct your question to the person. Please uh, put your name uh, there and, and um, your affiliation. Raise your hand when your, your question is ready. It will be picked up by staff uh, and brought uh, up here uh, for us uh, to do that. Um, in a way, while we're waiting for your cards uh, to make it uh, up front, let me just ask this question. Do you see this uh, basically uh, dialogue that has uh, taken place here in Washington, and this is addressed to all three, do you see it as a victory for diplomacy at the time where, where diplomacy has been on a run? Uh, in a way, is it a victory for both Qatari diplomacy and U.S. Uh, diplomacy? Would first. you like to comment yeah. on that? <laughs> I'll go first. Um, when I was uh, a dissertator up at the Fletcher School in Boston, we were involved in Qatari uh, diplomatic training. Um, so I was involved in several years of training. Uh, I think we trained a third of the foreign ministry <laughs> or something like that. Uh, a huge number of Qatari diplomats. And I've been thinking a lot about what we were teaching them. And one of the things we were teaching them is, as a small country, you have to get along with everybody. And, and, it, and it seemed they learned the lesson well to their own, at their own peril in terms of the, their enemies not liking their other friends. Uh, but they really have, I mean, look at what General Petraeus said at the Hudson Institute event, the anti-Qatar event earlier in the fall. He said, no one's angry at the Qataris for having Hamas and Taliban representatives, in fact, that was part of Qatari's longstanding role as a diplomatic uh, interlocutor, and, and U.S., Israel, other countries use this connection. So that, that sort of beating up on Qatar for that in the media was very much of a kind of a false narrative, where, where the real issue was dissidents from other Arab countries, uh, and of course, Qatar's different position on the Muslim Brotherhood, which uh, Qatar has explained as respecting the will of the people, that sort of thing, which, by the way, was the U.S. position on Egypt in, in, in 2012 and 2013, before the U.S. position changed. Um, so um, uh, all of that to say is uh, I think the Qataris have uh, waged very uh, skilled diplomacy here. Um, I would only add that when um, one of the leading officials said Trump could solve this in one phone call, I thought that was a bit hyperbolic. <laughs> um, uh, and I also noticed that the U.S. offer um, to, to use Camp David to solve the crisis is something I think the Qataris would accept, and I'm not sure if the other sides are, are precipitating out to Camp David somewhere where Trump doesn't even go that often, but um, he prefers his golf courses. But uh, uh, we, um, we'll, we'll see whether that, that offer leads anywhere. I think um, what's happening now uh, in the U.S. is not only is diplomacy winning this week, Khalil, but Tiller, I've long think, thought that Tillerson's job depends in part on a, uh, positive outcomes in the Middle East. Uh, 
Um, it's very clear that he's been playing second fiddle to other parts of the administration, including White House advisors, on a whole range of issues near and dear to the president. Uh, whereas on the Gulf, he's taken a lead. So it's very clear to me that uh, on a political level, the Qatar strategic dialogue is not only sort of, let's say, a, a victory for diplomacy in the moment, but a victory for Tillerson, um, who's had a somewhat problematic reign at the State Department. Um, if Tillerson gets a win, and it doesn't necessarily mean a final deal on the Gulf, but a win in terms of getting increased cooperation uh, on, on a range of Gulf uh, uh, and, and, and Middle Eastern issues, um, uh, uh, not, only, uh, not only is his position going to be lengthened probably at the State Department, but his position will be stronger at the State Department. I would also note, just to nuance slightly what I said earlier, um, the generals around Trump are a little bit divided on this. So I'd be wrong if I'd left you the impression that there's a single position in the defense establishment. Certainly the, the, uh, the Secretary of Defense and other senior defense officials have been very pro-dialogue, pro-diplomacy. Um, but McMaster and Kelly seem to be a little bit more on the other side of that conversation. So there's even a, a, a little bit of a difference of opinion about diplomacy and about resolving this conflict uh, within the, uh, the, the senior military and ex-military leadership around Trump. I hope that was useful. Very much so. Any other comments? Very quick answer to the sure. question. I wouldn't say, being objective, it's, I wouldn't say victory. Mm -hmm. It's a good practice for both sides. We, we might set a good habit, USA with other countries and Qatar with other countries. So being objective, we shall wait until the results come out. Yeah. But going back to history, it's been successful. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I think the Qataris don't mind having the summit at my Lego if that's going to be an yeah. issue. That, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, we, we can certainly use some golf trainers before going there, but uh, yeah. Uh, Regarding this being a victory for Qatar, I think this is a, a step forward, certainly. Uh, there was a lot of talk about who are our friends in Washington, who are the Qatari friends in Washington. We know that Tillerson and Mattis uh, are closer to the position of Qatar on dialogue and on ending this crisis than other officials uh, in the administration. We know that the White House was always you know, on a further note when it comes to how to end uh, this crisis and who, who should basically uh, end it and how. Uh, it's my belief, however, that the dialogue was an assurance of the, uh, that this relationship is not at a low point. It's, uh, it's on a high point. It can, it can uh, evolve. It can uh, become uh, stronger. And especially on three notes, as uh, Professor Lawrence rightly said, uh, the, the Oded base issue was a very contentious issue since the start of this uh, crisis. The talk about moving it, the talk about actually even the, the book that came out, uh, Fire and Fury, that actually suggested that there was, that there was even talk about this in the administration. Yeah. Uh, now we have an assurance that actually we're expanding Allodade Air Base. It's moving from being, to being a permanent uh, base. There's a, an expansion project that is not only in Allodade ba Base, but actually in other uh, U.S. bases around the world that will be financed by the Qataris. So, th so the military relationship is getting much stronger. When it comes to the security pact, we've heard something we haven't heard before from the Americans uh, this week, which is that the uh, United States is uh, obligated to uh, support the uh, independence and the security of uh, Qatar. And we have also heard the S Secretary of State saying that uh, this uh, crisis had a military impact on the United States, a negative military impact on the United States, which is something we all know was seen as a, a red line in the sand or a line in the sand uh, by the beginning of this crisis uh, in, the, in various uh, American statements. So it is a win for Qatar, but I, I tend to be very skeptical uh, of how this administration deals with its policy towards the Middle East. I don't think we have a coherent policy or the, the United States has a coherent policy towards the Middle East in general, and towards this crisis especially. Uh, policies tend to change uh, in this administration very quickly, and we've seen, as uh, William touched upon it, uh, we've seen the differences between the various generals and non-generals yeah. in the administration actually causing um, an, a narrative problem in, in how the United States talks. I'm optimistic in two things. First of all, 
uh, I got it from a high, uh, high level source at the uh, State Department that the uh, Camp David, the supposed Camp David summit, in, which, which apparently is going to take place or hopefully take place in May, that the United States already has uh, approval from the various leaders, uh, UAE, Qatar, and uh, Saudi Arabia especially, and that there will be talks held here in DC beforehand uh, by these leaders uh, individually with the, the Trump uh, administration. The calls that were made by Trump to our uh, Emir and the Emir of Kuwait were very hopeful. It was a very different uh, tone. I, I personally sat with the uh, Emir after this call, and His Highness basically said that the language in that call was quite different than we used to. There was a very good talk about the importance of unity in the Gulf. It is skeptical optimism at best, I think. Thank you. All right, the first uh, is a comment, uh, which you guys don't have to respond to, but uh, I will read it anyway. It's from a uh, good friend. Uh, Muhammad Awais was uh, basically praising uh, the center for this uh, panel, and particularly he's encouraged to hear some very articulate uh, Qatari voices re representing themselves uh, on this panel, but thank you to ev everybody on the panel for their uh, presentations. Uh, thank you, Muhammad. Uh, the first question that will need an answer is uh, Rafi Jabouri from Al Arabi TV. Do you think, uh, this is addressed to all panelists, do you think that the Qatari case is now better or properly represented in the U.S. Congress or to the U.S. Congress? Let me um, sure. begin to answer. And uh, I, The famed U.S. diplomat uh, uh, Pelletro, I believe, who did the PLO negotiations in Tunis. I had lunch with him shortly after that in Tunis. This is in 1989. And he said the hardest part of negotiating with the Palestinians is talking to Congress. Um, diplomats will tell you that. The hardest part of diplomacy is, 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 is putting together U.S. foreign policy with, with what con Congress believes. We had, used to have this uh, expression when I was at the State Department is that every congressional staffer wants to be Secretary of State. You know? And so there's this very complicated negotiation uh, that goes on uh, and, and you saw sort of a taste of what that conversation is like in the State of the Union speech um, as, as, as the Trump uh, administration in this, we used to call it a, a Christmas tree. That speech was written by 100 people, right? So there's a, there's the, everyone puts their ornament on it. And, and, and so the Christmas tree speech, um, but it was not a Christmas tree speech that was sort of, let's say, a litany of what traditional foreign policy goals were uh, 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 and domestic policy goals. It was more um, all the different pieces of the Trump administration getting something right on the tree. And, and part of that is feeding red meat to the base, right? And, and that's a set of issues that have been framed uh, through the Trump campaign and, 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 and up until now. So, um, uh, of course, there's a whole breadth of opinion within Congress. Um, I think a lot of the discussions to do with the Middle East have been framed for U.S. Congress people around the Muslim ban uh, and all of the reactions to the Muslim ban in the courts. Um, a lot of U.S. Congress people have discovered they have Muslim constituencies, and that is starting to change uh, uh, both Republican and, um, and Democratic uh, Congress people's positions as they realize that Muslim Americans vote in high numbers uh, and feel strongly about certain issues. Now, I haven't seen any polling on what U.S. Muslims think about the Qatar crisis, but I suspect um, that uh, uh, they would be uh, uh, generally sympathetic uh, uh, towards a resolution of the con uh, conflict and things getting back to the status quo ante. So that's the beginning of an answer. <laughs> Thank you. Any other additions? Uh, okay, so uh, this is actually a good point because I can be quite self-critical here and say that uh, I think Qatar's shortcoming in the United States was always focusing on uh, the institutions and especially uh, state and defense. The Qatar-US relation has always been part of these two relationships and a very turbulent relationship with the Treasury uh, Department that kind of goes up and down uh, with reference to things like, uh, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Reem talked about the uh, terrorism and financing terrorism issues, which was always a contentious issue, of course. Uh, when it comes to Congress, you have to remember three things. First of all, Qatar changed ambassadors, five ambassadors during the last decade in the US, which doesn't allow, to be honest, for somebody to have you know, deep roots in DC. And as we all know that DC is this large social zoo where you have to have a very 
real presence in people's lives to have a real effect. Second of all, there are very few Qataris in this world. You have to remember that the national population of Qatar is 300,000, give or take a few thousand. So there are not enough Qataris to go around when it comes to, yes. So I mean, having two, two Qataris on this panel is actually very exceptional in Qatar. <laughs> 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 yeah. So uh, there was never a, a Qatari lobby in, in Washington. The embassy was always small. Uh, and the focus was on these institutional, professional uh, relationship with uh, state officials, with the uh, White House. Also, there was always a better relationship between Qatar and the Democrats than the relationship between Qatar and the Republicans, uh, as opposite to the Saudis, who have always had great uh, links to the Republicans and not so much with the Democrats. And obviously, I don't need to tell you that didn't, this didn't work to our advantage during this crisis. Right now in Congress, we have a main problem that is two faceted. First of all, the UAE ambassador, who is uh, the point leader when it comes to the, the, the lobby of the Saudi Emirati Alliance in DC, has been very active, very prominent. Uh, he's been able to uh, infiltrate most uh, staffers and uh, con Congress members, especially on the Republican side during the past couple of months. And before, of course, he had a very good working relationship with most of them. And therefore, we're really late in the game trying to influence Congress members. And we have seen a lot of antagony against Qatar, especially in the beginning of the crisis. It was reported to me by one of our diplomats that the first couple of interviews or, or meetings that, we, that uh, Qatari officials held with staffers and congressmen were border insulting to Qatari officials in the beginning of the crisis. Now, it's, of course, the situation is much better. We've seen uh, better relationships, and we've seen different people come into the game. The other thing is that the, the UAE uh, ambassador also did a very smart thing, which is working with think tanks and research centers. I won't go into detail here, uh, because I expect that uh, in front of me are some people who, who are within that realm. But uh, we have seen that funding, uh, intelligence, intelligence uh, sharing, and event holding with these uh, think tanks and centers have resulted in uh, a Saudi Marathi lean in, in this, uh, leaning in these uh, centers when it came to policy papers that were presented to staffers and uh, congressmen. And we have been, I mean, the, the officials who were me meeting with congressmen, uh, the Qatari officials, have always said that they, was always, uh, they always embattled almost the same policy paper. So every time you go into a meeting with a congressman, you hear the, the talking points are exactly the same in this meeting, which means that you know, the source is basically the same uh, towards the antagony uh, against uh, Qatar. I think now we need to do much more in that uh, regard, but the situation now is, is certainly better than it was in the beginning of the crisis. Can I, can I add one point? Sure. Just a, a practical point. Um, and I learned this as a diplomat. Uh, policy is made in the US government executive branch and legislative branch at the mid-level, not the senior level. Whereas in, in, in most of the countries the US deals with, policy is made right at the top. And so we often have a mismatch where senior people from foreign countries are dealing with senior people in the US before that spade work has been done at the lower level. I often used to say at the State Department, your senior should meet with our mid-levels <laughs> you know, before they meet with the, with the upper. I once got an email from the Tunisian embassy by mistake, um, and they had the email addresses of 400 staffers. That was how many staffers the Tunisian embassy felt they needed to know to get assistance levels like Jordan gets. I mean, they had, they had learned that game. Um, and, and that's the type of spade work that um, Mejid's talking about. It's, it's, it, that's, you have to get to know the staffers, you have to convince the staffers, work with the staffers. Obviously the staffers don't work independently of the members and the senators, but um, uh, they're open to things and, uh, and, and, and that's how Congress works. All right, thank you. Uh, just, I guess, uh, to be a, a a little bit fairer to everybody concerned. I, I know there are at least three or four uh, people in the audience who are engaged in this battle that was referred to, the battle of the lobbies, uh, and on both sides, uh, realistically speaking. I see people who are on the uh, Qatari side in this battle in the audience, and I see people on the Emirati and Saudi side uh, in our audience. So all of you are welcome here. Uh, but let me just add uh, the following. Uh, I would say with regards to the Congressional, as an observer and as someone who's personally uh, uh, interested in, in the lobbying aspect of this campaign or this battle, uh, 
having been uh, spent at least 30 years in Washington in lobbying in previous incarnations. Uh, let me say that uh, the, the, the battle has changed a lot. Uh, I mean, the, the, the number of companies that are right now assisting uh, the Qatar aspect of the campaign has uh, more than tripled uh, over the past uh, few months. Of course, when you triple from nothing, you know, it's still <laughs> limited, but it, it, they have. Uh, there, there are at least, uh, I would say, six or seven uh, major firms uh, uh, helping. Uh, with that, the uh, Qatari presence on Capitol Hill, uh, I know for sure just from personal observation, uh, hundreds of meetings uh, have taken place uh, over the past uh, six, seven months, uh, particularly the last four, I would say. Um, uh, quite a few delegations uh, from members of Congress and their staff uh, have uh, visited Qatar uh, specifically uh, during uh, this uh, period. So I would say, I, I, you know, just uh, objectively speaking, I would say that uh, the issue is a little bit better understood on Capitol Hill, not necessarily uh, hasn't, I agree with much, that it hasn't reached necessarily ideal uh, uh, position based on the factors that he uh, delineated, but it's certainly uh, a lot more uh, uh, fair, there's a better understanding of the issues uh, than, than we have uh, witnessed uh, in the past. Uh, the next uh, question is addressed also to the panel from Bill uh, Clifford, World Affairs Council of America. In light of uh, this week's events, uh, are there any levers by which Saudi, UAE, et cetera, are in a position to intensify, actually, uh, the blockade kind of going in, in the re reverse uh, uh, direction, pre or post uh, the Camp David that was referred to, or have they been neutralized from your perspective at this time? You want to start, Majid? Uh, Majid, uh, you want to take a jab yeah, at this? Sure. Okay. So the same problem we have with the uh, U.S. administration at the moment, we have it with the Saudis and the Emiratis, which is there is no coherent policy. There is no trend that you can follow. It's very difficult to understand exactly what's going to happen in the next day. Uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis seemed like, as, well, as William rightly said, uh, to minimize escalation for a while. However, this is not in all aspects. So when it comes to the media, for example, the, the very local media and the use of social media, we've seen escalation from prominent uh, social media figures that are linked to uh, leaders in the two countries. Uh, just while we were sitting in this uh, uh, panel, uh, somebody sent me, uh, they, they had a gathering yesterday with the king in Saudi Arabia and uh, supposed opposition figures, Qatari opposition figures, uh, three people from the royal family, uh, which, were, which live in uh, exile, attending that, and a Qatari poet apparently giving, uh, uh, reciting a poem there, you know, that's very critical of, uh, of Qatar. So there is escalation at, at some point, at some aspects. Politically speaking, militarily speaking, economically speaking, escalation has gone down. We have seen, for example, uh, even, and this was not publicized, but Dubai, for example, started inviting Qatari businessmen to conduct business normally again in Dubai. Of course, not as normal as it was before the crisis, but uh, moving from a situation where they couldn't actually reach their assets uh, or even uh, delegate uh, their authority to, to someone else over these uh, assets, now they've been told that they can actually you know, work around this and they'd find some solutions to all this. Militarily speaking, of course, we've seen the incursions by, uh, U uh, by UAE uh, airplanes in Qatari uh, airspace, but that was also halted and we haven't seen any more escalation since that has started. Polit politically, we have seen a reduction in the meetings of the quartet, the blockading quartet, which was supposedly after the Manama uh, meeting was supposed to have like a, a, a I think it was said that it was going to be a monthly or bi-monthly meeting of the Council of Ministers. Now this has stopped and there was only one meeting last week on the side of another meeting for the coalition over Yemen uh, to talk about the Qatari issue. We have also, be also seen, and I, I hope that I'm reading this uh, correctly, the zealous of uh, Saudi Arabia in supporting UAE narrative has kind of gone down. We have seen, for example, when there, there was uh, ill talk of the Emir's mother for some reason in, uh, by UAE figures the Saudis actually came out in support of her and said that this would not be accepted in the Saudi context. When the issue with the incursions of the planes and the 
the complaint that was uh, sent to the United Nations, the Saudis actually said nothing about this. They didn't, they didn't come out in support of the UAE. So there might be some de-escalation, but I must uh, warn that this de-escalation de is within some aspects, but in other aspects, we are seeing continuous escalation. Okay, William. Do you, uh, want, me, do you want me to address that? Or maybe tell yeah, I have another questions. question for yeah. you, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Mahmoud Abu uh, Rubi, you mentioned that uh, Qatar isn't doing or saying things that made or make its position worse, but how do they make their position better in this crisis? Oh, well, that's very similar to what I was going to say in answer to the first question as well, so let me address both. Um, so going to the first question, but I'll get into the second question. Um, one top expert on the blockading countries told me as I was preparing for this event that um, the GCC crisis isn't even a top 10 issue for Saudi Arabia. Um, so g given that, um, the likelihood that they're going to expend a lot of uh, effort uh, 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 escalating their demands uh, is very unlikely. Um, a second piece of evidence is that if you look at the 13 demands and you analyze the demands, one thing that stands out is that they are almost impossible to meet, uh, certainly with any notion of sovereignty. So unless Qatar was going to become a, 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 a vassal state or, or go back to a 1980s or before sort of position of Saudi Arabia, that which is just not going to happen. And, and the fact that those demands were so over the top uh, means that right from the beginning, the Saudis and the Emiratis in particular were contemplating a long crisis, not a short crisis, sort of creating a crisis that wouldn't have an immediate deal. Um, they could have, for example, just used what they consider violations of the 2013-2014 secret agreement as a basis, but they didn't. They did, they did this other thing. So in answer to the question, going from um, uh, a 13 impossible demands to meet to triple 13 impossible to meet, you know, going from impossible to meet to triple impossible to meet, uh, um, it doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, in negotiation theory, you don't often meet the demands of your negotiating partner. You try to meet the, the concerns, right, the interests of your negotiating partner. The two huge interests for Saudis vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Qatar in relation to, to what I'm saying are, number one, Iran, and number two, Saudi dissidents, right? <laughs> And, and, and as a corollary, Muslim Brotherhood in general. There's a deal to be made with Qatar <laughs> on Iran, on dissidents, and on, um, uh, uh, on the Muslim Brotherhood, um, uh, which gets me to my final point on this, which is that uh, one person characterizing what the final deal might look like said there'll be a public part, there'll be a private written part that comes out, there'll be a private written part that never supposed to come out, and then there'll be an oral part we never even hear about. Mm -hmm. um, so so um, uh, it'll be interesting, you know, if we do get a deal, when we get a deal, uh, as we f finding out over the long term, you know, what these discussions were, because uh, Qatar does need to address the underlying concerns, uh, valid concerns of Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and the other blockading countries. Okay. Um, I mean, we have, yeah, we do have a question on this <laughs> specific issue from yeah. uh, Greg Abtendillian. Uh, and I wonder, uh, Majid, if you'd like to add a little bit more to whether the issue of the relationship uh, between Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood has been temporarily or permanently diffused uh, at this time or not. Okay, uh, so uh, let, let me just start with this uh, fact that a lot of people uh, don't, uh, don't focus on. Yes, there are 13 demands, and yes, they are mostly impossible to meet. <laughs> But the funny thing is that, and, and by the way, in the meeting I just mentioned uh, a while ago about the, the, the Quartet meeting, they came out with a statement saying, we stand by our 13 demands. Demand number 12 is that if these demands are not met within 10 days, they are void. Right. <laughs> so Qatar and the blockading countries actually agree on sticking to these demands. <laughs> uh, and they still say 13 demands, and this is quite interesting. And this kind of shows you the kind of... Uh, psyche that is dealing with this crisis. The demands are not really serious as much as they are, you know, uh, uh, a way of just uh, legitimizing the, the actions that took place. When it comes to the relationship between, uh, of course, the, the, the main four issues always mentioned, the relationship between Qatar and uh, militants uh, in uh, various places, especially in Syria, the relationship between Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood, and the relationship between Qatar and Hamas. These are the three relations, and of course with Iran, but this is a different issue. And dissidents in general. And dissidents, yeah, yeah. in general. Yeah. Of course, it, uh, it, the, 
the talk of dissidents is not used that much in the, in the rhetoric of the right. Emiratis and Saudis, because that's not what they like to advertise, especially when it comes to the Western context. But uh, when it comes to uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, this was an issue during the Arab Spring and in the relationship with Hamas. Hamas won a general election in 2006. Qatar, before the election, said that it would support uh, the democratic, uh, democratic move in Palestine towards having uh, a parliamentary government. And it such happened that Hamas won that election. And Qatar actually went around even uh, with the Europeans, worked out with the Europeans and with the Americans so that uh, a democratically elected government should be accepted to set a precedent and that this would actually uh, help the cause in general and uh, would, be, would moderate uh, Hamas. Sadly, of course, this was not the view shared in all around the world. The, uh, the Gaza Ramallah issue happened. And uh, there was always a good relationship between the uh, political system that governed Gaza under the blockade that was enacted on Gaza and Qatar that was actually helping Gaza in coordination, by the way, with the United States and Israel. You have to understand that after Egypt closed its borders, Qatari uh, funding and uh, infrastructure uh, help in Gaza was going through the Israelis. So to say that Qatar has a relationship with Hamas and supporting Hamas against Israel, then one has to explain why does Israel allow Qataris to go through the Israeli border into Gaza to help with infrastructure and so on. And by this the, is the way, question. Israel just went to Qatar, a secret delegation just Yes, and the secret delegation actually went. <laughs> and there was always, by the way, a relationship between uh, Israel and yeah. Qatar. That, that, and uh, I've worked with the foreign ministry for a while. Yeah. And the idea always was that uh, we can do through dialogue more than we can do through uh, boycott. And that there should be kind, a kind of dialogue always open, regardless of the disagreements. And Qatar has been very prominently pro-Palestinian. It's been very prominently supportive of the Palestinian cause. And this has not changed. But having a dialogue with the Israelis was always an issue uh, that the Qataris feel uh, strongly about. Of course, after uh, 2008 and the Gaza summit and the war on, on Gaza, diplomatic relationship between the two countries was severed. The trade office in, in, uh, in Qatar was closed. And there was a tension in the relationship, but there was still some communication, especially when it came to uh, helping, uh, helping Gaza. The issue regarding the Muslim Brotherhood was a very uh, hot topic during the Arab Spring. The, uh, the narrative, and I, I find this very dangerous, that we classify this as a Muslim Brotherhood, uh, non-Muslim Brotherhood issue. It was an Arab Spring, a populist movement issue, and anti-populist movement issue. This was the whole thing. During the Arab Spring, there were uh, the, the uprisings in uh, Egypt, in Tunis, in uh, Yemen, in uh, Syria. Islamists were prominent in leading and being part of these uprisings. Qatar has supported all types of governments that came out of these uprisings, regardless of their ideological background. In Tunis, Qatar is one of the biggest supporters of the current government, which is actually a very liberal, non-Islamic government, while the, uh, the Islamists now are in opposition. But Qatar is a very good supporter of that regime. In, uh, in Egypt, Qatar supported the first military junta, the military council, and then supported the, uh, the Morsi government, the elected government, and then supported the new situation in Egypt and actually accepted the coup d'etat that uh, took place, and, and Qatar's letter, the Emir of Qatar sent a letter to Assisi in the first day after he took uh, power, congratulating him for taking power. So to say that Qatar is always a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood is not correct. It is a supporter, and this has been, by the way, the, the way that Qatar has uh, operated for a really long time, which is supporting uh, the demands of the people. Qatar has always believed that this is, the change in the region is a train that's on its tracks. You can either stand in its way on the tracks or be in the driving, uh, what is it called, cabin? Or, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and there was no, no third option. And the UAE, Saudi Arabia have decided that they would like to stand in these tracks and apparently they were able to block that train from uh, going on. But Qatar still believes that change in the region is coming and if we don't accept it, we are going to be vassals of history that will not uh, be part of the future of the region. Can I, can I add one just quick point to support that? Word. One sentence. Um, Qatar has a long history of welcoming secular Arab 
leftist uh, intellectuals as much as brotherhood. I mean, their, their position, is, as Majid said, has been about um, uh, people's will much more than being a pro-Muslim brotherhood regime. I may add, sure. just to yeah. rephrase the entire thing from a legal perspective, yeah. what Dr. Majid had just stated about the Muslim Brotherhood is that they do, they've done it legitimately. So Qatar have done it legitimately through what? Through the legal status of uh, Muslim Brotherhood. They haven't got involved with the Muslim Brotherhood unless they got the status, the legal status of government after the election. So it's law also. It has a legal perspective. Okay, uh, Dr. Reem, uh, with regards to the uh, agreement and the, the strategic dialogue ongoing right now, in the next phase, what do you feel uh, is going to be prominent among the set of legal issues that you refer to in your presentation? Direct question would be the MOU of uh, counterterrorism. Because as we can see, um, I don't know if you heard about the uh, mutual evaluation reports and et cetera. It has to do with international standard. We have the 2020 evaluation coming, so it's another motive for Qatar to do better, be it internal or external, be it internally with the Qatar institution and external in installation with the US. Okay, the uh, discussion we just had with regards to the different groups uh, has the dialogue brought up the issue of Qatari position vis-a-vis uh, -vis democracy in the region? Has it been specifically asked from the American side? And that's a question from Munji CS uh, ID. Uh, and dealing with other political actors in the region. Um, I don't know the answer, but I do know the dialogue has focused a lot on um, human rights uh, concerns. Uh, trafficking and labor concerns. Um, and so what you might call the democratic conversation has been mostly around a set of, of, of rights issues. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and of course, terrorism financing, going back to the, the MOU. Qatar has not denied its problem in these areas. It's, it's actively cooperating with the US to address a whole range of concerns. I don't know about democracy, if you have any uh, thoughts on that. Okay, and, yeah. uh, I, I would say sure. it would strengthen democracy because as the, in, the, in the light of current situation, the blockade is a stumbling block to achieve the ultimate goal of trying to solve the problem of terrorism. So it, it, it is, it's signaling now a message of democracy that we're trying to do something to advance the situation for the benefit of not Qataris or Americans, for the benefit of the humanity in general. Uh, if I can add something. Uh, uh, just to say something on, on the democratic issue in Qatar, that uh, this crisis actually has helped Qatar a lot in advancing a lot of its goals, even internally. Um, I, I don't want to sound you know, very critical of, of the neighboring countries, but uh, there are a lot of adma advancements that Qatar wanted to take place and were hampered by uh, demand from these countries in the past. Qatar, uh, since 2013, has tried to be uh, very accommodating to Saudi and uh, Emirati requests. One of them, resulted in delaying uh, the parliamentary elections uh, from 2013 indefinitely. When the crisis happened, and of course Qatar was now less inclined to accommodate these uh, countries, immediately, uh, three or four months after the blockade, the Emir in front of the Shura Council, which is a consultative body that is basically uh, in place of the parliament, uh, said that he instructed the government to present within this uh, cycle the new law for elections, and the elections will be held in 2019 for a, a full-fledged parliament according to the constitution. So uh, Qatar is moving towards democracy on its own also when it comes to, uh, to its own political and uh, legislative uh, framework. But one of the three, there were three documents that resulted out of the uh, dialogue. One of them, of course, was, as uh, my colleague said, on human trafficking. Uh, the other was uh, on uh, security, oh, the, the other, sorry, was on uh, the dialogue itself and how it should be an annual dialogue and, and the framework for it to be an annual dialogue between Qatar and the United States. The third was on security. And it uh, specifically uh, mentioned a lot of uh, cooperation issues or cooperation points between Qatar and the United States in regional security and in regional stability. So there was an attempt to find common ground between the United States and Qatar on the view towards the region how the region should uh, develop and how to tackle the, the issues in the region, including, of course, democratization and uh, uh, change that resulted from the Arab Spring. All right, let's end this Q&A session with a challenging question. Ken, World Press asks, does a country with the size of Qatar, as you referred to, uh, 
250,000 uh, uh, native population and the presence of foreign troops. Does Qatar really have an independent foreign policy or does it just have to do what it's, be, what it's get, being told? <laughs> I'll start. Go ahead. Um, if you mean, the, is the U.S. dictating Qatari foreign policy? No. <laughs> Uh, not on Iran, <laughs> not on a whole range of issues Imagine uh, just flagged. Um, uh, uh, the U.S. certainly has a strong and strengthening relationship with Qatar, but by no means dictates, you know, who Qatar hosts, what Qatar says, what Qatar does. Um, I, I found, um, as a diplomat dealing with prickly relationships, it's very hard to get another country to say what you want them to say it's sometimes a lot easier to get them not to say anything. Uh, and that refers you to my concluding point in my, in my first remarks. I think sometimes the U.S. might be able to get Qatar, convince a Qatar to say, not say something about an issue, or Qatar to convince the U.S. to not say something about an issue than to actually give them the talking points. From legal perspective, again, I wouldn't say that U.S. is dictating Qatar. Uh, a strong message that is stems from the Constitution that resembles the total separation of power internally. So definitely that would be reflected in the foreign policy. Yeah, uh, I kind of understand the question from another perspective, which yeah. is, is, is Qatar uh, large enough to have its own foreign policy, or is it? Uh, yeah. First of all, if we were going to take a country's ability to function as an independent uh, sovereign power internationally to size, then let's talk about Israel. I mean, Israel is not that much bigger than uh, Qatar, size or population-wise. It has much more challenges to its sovereignty than, uh, than Qatar. Uh, but of course, Israel is one of the strongest players in the region and in, uh, in international uh, politics. It has its, certainly its own independent foreign policy. And Qatar has, a, has uh, actually, uh, I mean, more of a sovereign reality than, uh, than Israel when it comes to these points. I mean, Qatar has a very strong economic standing. It has a very good standing internationally. Uh, it has a very vibrant and uh, diverse role internationally when it comes to mediation and working with various entities. Of course, there was always a question, why is Qatar not Bahrain and why is Qatar not Kuwait? So the Bahrainis decided to be a vassal of the Saudis because th this is mainly because of their geopolitical and uh, economic situation. The Kuwaitis, however, a different story, were the Qatar of their 80s, if we would like to use that analogy. They were very active in the regional issues. They supported the establishment of the PLO. They supported the establishment of Hamas, which actually took place in Kuwait. They were actively... Uh, helping the Iraqis against the Iranians. They were actively working in uh, Southeast Asia in uh, charity projects and, uh, projects and uh, advancing uh, causes there. And then the Iraq war, the Iraq -Kuwait war happened. And Kuwait decided that it needs to take a step back and have less influence internationally. This, however, hasn't protected Kuwait from Saudi Emirati aggression. Right after the war, Right after the invasion of Kuwait, Saudi Arabia annexed al khafji an area of Kuwait. Now, during this crisis, Kuwait is actively being targeted by Saudi media and uh, Emirati media, and even politically pressured to take uh, a position that is relevant to the, that is uh, closer to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. So I believe Qatar has only one option to go, which is to be its own independent force in the region, to be a force to be reckoned with. Yes, it is small. But Israel, Singapore, other small states have their presence internationally, have their independent foreign policy. It is not unheard of for a country of this size to have its independent foreign policy. And I believe it should, and anything else would be a betrayal to Qatar's sovereignty. Uh, All right. Yes, Just a quick please. data point. There's, I, I wrote a paper for the World Bank with a group of scholars years ago. There's about 60 small states. And they have very different types of foreign policy, including cooperating with each other. They've been very big on climate change. But there's a whole sort of art and science of, of small state diplomacy, uh, which I referred to earlier. And it's, uh, 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 there's nothing not viable about small state foreign policy. It's just different uh, as, as to how, and that gets to back, what, back to what Medjid was saying about hegemonic states versus small states. OK, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for their great presentations.